screaming, and uh, I'll never get used to an empty <laughs> area, but I'm hoping you are enjoying the day and that it's good to, that you've tuned in tonight. So let's turn to page 979, 798, sorry. 798, surely goodness and mercy. to welcome you also tonight to our midweek service here at Faith Bible Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Cole. Thank you, Pastor Seth. Appreciate uh, missionary Justin Dye playing the piano. And we have Sean O'Mara upstairs on the microphones and Bob Gorski's downstairs working on the computers so that this ministry can be available to you. And uh, Frank Broughton's been helping a lot too, so uh, we're so grateful for them. Just before we have a word of prayer, I want to read uh, a scripture that uh, uh, caused uh, a lot of prayer uh, for uh, the Thessalonican church uh, regarding a separation that the leaders of the church or the church planners and the congregation had, in their case because of persecution, in our case, because of a virus. But uh, just before we pray, I want to read a few verses out of 1 Thessalonians 2 and 3. Verse 17 says, But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire, night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. And so there was a separation there between the people and the, the leaders, the church planters that began the church at Thessalonica. And they uh, said that they were still in their heart, uh, were absent for a short time in presence, but not in heart. And we kind of feel that way too. We miss you. And uh, actually, a part of our heart is saddened by this 
uh, to come to an empty building um, three times a week now as we have these live streams. But you're in our heart and we're praying for the day when we hope we'll be able to see your faces again and have fellowship with you. And uh, they keep talking in uh, the authorities, the government, about the date of April 29th, them making a decision. That doesn't mean it's going to be over with, but they'll make a decision on kind of reopening the country is the way they're calling it. Now, that's exactly three weeks from today, so we have a long time to go. Uh, I think three weeks is a long time, uh, but uh, we're just going to have to continue doing this for at least three more weeks, and then we'll find out probably if, if we'll be able to get together uh, in public gatherings, and I sure hope so. Let's pray to that end. But let's, uh, let's pray right now for those in authority and uh, for the rest of our evening here tonight. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, that... Uh, your word addresses the subject of separation uh, and how the uh, missionaries Paul and Silas and Timothy just longed to see the face of those at the church in Thessalonica again. They were distanced for a short time. And, and Lord, we feel the same way. None of us ever expected this. And the church is uh, across the country going to be empty tonight with the midweek services except for every effort that's made through live stream and Facebook and YouTube and whatever other creative ways have been discovered to get the word of the Lord out. So we just pray that our time together would be special though we're absent from each other. We pray tonight for Brother Justin Dye as he brings the message here in a few minutes to us from the word of the Lord. We thank you, Father, for the things you've been showing him, and we pray that your Holy Spirit would uh, speak uh, tonight and make the night profitable. We pray for those in authority over us, the president and his uh, cabinet members that make up his administration, uh, the governor of New York, the Erie County uh, executive here, and even our uh, local government uh, in Eden that we keep hearing from uh, as they send us messages. Uh, Lord, give them wisdom. And uh, we're praying for an end to this virus affecting our country in every aspect and, and pray, Lord, that it would go away. But we also know, Lord, as, as Bible students, uh, that you have used pestilence many times in history to try to get the attention of people that uh, turn their hearts back to Thee, and we pray to that end that believers uh, would turn their hearts back to You and the unsaved would think about things that are eternal and uh, come to know the Lord as their Savior. Lord, I thank You for all the good stories believers in Christ have been sharing with me about opportunities to witness to people lately. And and uh, despite the distancing, you're, you're still opening doors. And Lord, give us doors of utterance uh, to get your word out. Uh, bless, Lord, uh, as we go forward. Help us, uh, Lord, to uh, stay in your word all personally at home, to, to get into the Bible and into prayer and, and even draw ourselves closer to thee. Lord, uh, keep us together. Keep the flocks together and all around our country and world and and we pray that there'd be even some growth that would come out of this and and uh, maybe some more fondness for fellowship that perhaps we didn't have because uh, sometimes lord we don't know what we have till we lose it for a while and and so help us we pray give each one of us grace uh, in this time of need and fill us with your holy spirit uh, use us in these times to be your witnesses Bless tonight's services in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. I want to make a few announcements, not many tonight. Uh, uh, well, as I said in my prayer, uh, three weeks from today, April 29th, they're talking on the federal and state level about making some kind of announcement on what, <laughs> what May is going to look like, uh, whether they open up schools and businesses and hopefully churches too. Um, so that's three more weeks. We'll do this exactly the way we're doing it. Now, I know I sent a postcard out inviting you to a open-air uh, church service this Sunday Easter, 
please ignore that. We are not going to do that. And uh, we were hoping we would be able to, but uh, so this Sunday and uh, the next three Sundays, we will have, again, our Sunday morning services at 10 a.m. and then 11 a.m. and then 6 p.m. and uh, live stream. Uh, so uh, please tune in, get others to tune in, and pray for the success of our media outreach. As for those of you that go to Hilltop Baptist Church, that, their media ministry is now up and running. And so I want to encourage you to go to their website, hilltop-baptist.com. And on the home page, all the way over to the right at the top, you'll see two words, the green. That's what it's going to say, the green. And uh, that is the name of their media ministry. It's from a Bible verse in the New Testament where the, the people came to a very green place. And it says they sat down and the Lord... Uh, taught them the word of the Lord. And so, uh, you have that website up and running now. And uh, you can go there. There are already uh, devotionals. Pastor Lewis uh, does these little devotionals for five or six minutes. And there's going to be a, a missionary uh, conference on there. Missionaries preaching by way of videos they send in. And uh, missionary presentations. Uh, I will be on there Sunday morning uh, at 9.30 for Easter, uh, preaching the Easter message. And uh, that's just something you can stay tuned to now. Uh, in fact, it's, it's going to be a media ministry that's just there constantly. You can go there anytime you want. And there will probably be new videos, devotionals, things like that. And uh, so I, I wanted to announce that that is now available for those of you that go to Hilltop Baptist Church. All right. Uh, again, uh, we, we are going to have some special Sunday nights come up here, April 19th through the 26th. And every night in between, uh, Sunday, April 19th, and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then Sunday, April 26th, every one of those nights... There's going to be a uh, program. It's not just for children. It's for the whole family. It's for teenagers. It's for single people. But uh, especially the focus is going to be on children every night for 30 minutes using this live stream right here at fbbc.com. And, and uh, a program of our children's church workers with a variety of things for the children to enjoy. But it's going to be a real blessing to families. It's, it's something that we hope even families from the community will tune into for some good, clean uh, fun and inspiration and Bible messages. And they'll be able to learn a little bit more about God and a little bit more about the Bible every single night. And uh, so, uh, pray for this outreach. It's just a creative outreach that uh, we hope uh, we're going to Send out mailings to all of our church children, daily vacation Bible school children, Patch the Pirate children, uh, CEF children that come to our uh, Bible school clubs in the public schools, as well as ads in the penny saver for families. And let's just pray that people will tune in and, and maybe right about then they're going to be looking for something to do for their families. They're all home, they're locked in, and we hope... Uh, this will just be a creative way to uh, get the gospel out. All right, uh, just a couple other quick things. Sean O'Mara and Rachel Bell are getting married on April the 18th, Saturday at 1 o'clock. And um, I don't know if, Bob, I don't know if you can put that uh, address up, the website address, because you can only live stream. You can't attend the wedding, but we certainly would love to watch it. It's going to be short. But we're so excited for them and uh, for their life ahead of them. And so keep them in your prayers. And then finally, all the way into May already, May 15th, uh, Teen Tri-State Formal has been canceled. Uh, Dr. Uh, George Alquist called me uh, yesterday and just told me that they just didn't think they could pull it off, uh, being this close uh, to the uh, quarantine, I guess we'd call it. So... Uh, 
We won't be having that this year. That's a bummer, but um, we hope to have some things later in the year for teens. So, okay, one more song now, and then Brother Justin's going to bring our message this evening. Page 467. If you know it, you can sing along at home. I need thee every hour. 467. I need thee every hour, most precious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee. I need thee every hour. Stay thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when thou art thine. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. I need thee every hour in joy. I come to thee, I need thee every hour, most holy one. Oh, make me thine of thee, thy blessed son. I need thee, oh, I need thee, every hour I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come. All right, I was at a pastor's school one time out in Hammond, Indiana, where there was thousands and thousands of people gathered, about five, four, five, six thousand people, and the microphone quit working. And uh, they couldn't figure it out, and a man came up uh, from their, one of the technicians in the church, and he started taking wires apart. He got a soldering iron out, and he soldered it back together and got the microphone working. And the pastor wisely said that that man was the most important person in church that day because he used his gift uh, to help get the word of the Lord out. And so let us not take for granted these guys like Bob Gorski, Frank Broughton, Sean O'Mara, Jake Hirsch, others that work to enable us to do these things and purchase the equipment and know what they're doing. So thank you, men. And if you're enjoying the live streaming, you might want to get a chance sometime to thank these guys for what they do. We thank the Lord for Brother Justin. He happens to be back in the States, as you know the story, most of you. And uh, we appreciate him. He hopes to get back to Papua New Guinea when that country opens and he can get back there. So you be in prayer for him, but he's going to bring our Bible message tonight. Brother Justin. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. I appreciate it. Uh, open, if you would. Let's go to Mark. Mark chapter 12 tonight. I'm going to have to switch back into my English brain. I got done recording a pigeon sermon this morning for uh, the radio station over in Papua New Guinea. Uh, <laughs> it's nice to be able to still have a little bit of a preaching involvement there. And, uh, you know, they're dealing with quarantine too. And, um, you know, Chad has been basically on the mission station, but broadcasting from that radio station, they tried to get that up and running before everything kind of shut down, so they'd still have a way to get it out, and uh, man, it's going good, so uh, we're thankful for ways to stay in touch. They didn't have this back in 1917. I'd have been telegraphing my uh, sermon, so <laughs> that'd be boring. One letter at a time. Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. Tonight, I just want to speak for a little while. Uh, maybe a couple hours on make love great again. Make love great again. I had a couple other titles, but Michael Mayer and I decided that 
Frank probably wouldn't agree with them, so we went with Make Love Great Again. How could he not love that title? And uh, you'll see what I mean as we get into this, but let's go ahead and start in Mark chapter 12. We're going to go to verse 28. Mark chapter 12, verse 28. It says, And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, The first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our Lord is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. We see here the scribe replying in verse 32, it says, He said unto him, Well, master, thou hast said the truth. For there is one God, and there is none other but he. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself, is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Notice what that scribe is saying. Christ, if you read through this passage and you read through the companion passages to this, he's, Christ is arguing, he's being tested, he's being tried, he's try, they're trying to trip up Christ. These are the religious people of his time, the people who put value into this system, value into these sacrifices and these holy days and the holy things that they try and do and the Pharisees who've added to that and they dress a certain way and they talk a certain way. Man, they put that as primo Objectives. This is number one, something we should be doing. And this scribe admits, because he knows his Bible, or at least the law, that loving God and loving others is more valuable than all those sacrifices. Now, I am someone who, uh, when I am here in the States, normally I'm preaching on missions, and normally I'm either going to try and exhort you to look at the lost people of the world and ask you what your part would be in that, whether it's witnessing or, or giving. And when I get on giving, man, I talk about sacrificial giving because that's what missions giving is. So we sacrifice here. Hopefully you do. Hopefully you still sacrifice. We're not out there killing cows or killing goats or anything like that. But you should have some sacrifice in your life. And this scribe is agreeing with Christ that, yeah, that's all fine and good. But love matters more than that. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I pray that you just take this time. Lord, I pray that you would just guide my words. Lord, I pray that you would, uh, Lord, help everything to function well tonight. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would work on hearts. I know that uh, most everybody sitting in their home and they probably have distractions that they normally wouldn't have in church. And Lord, I pray that you would just speak to them tonight. Lord, I pray that you would just challenge us on our love and how we are behaving as Christians. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be more effective than we ever have been. Lord, I thank you. Yes, thank you for, Lord, sending some pestilence to us. Lord, I pray that you help us to react correctly. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be willing to grow and listen to you. I pray all these things in your name. Amen. So first off, we see here, loving God. Loving God. We see Jesus saying that loving God really is the key to everything here. On these hang the law. Everything else comes after these things. And, you know, after living in Papua New Guinea for a little bit, I understand that so much better. Um, we, I've had discussions with Chad, uh, my partner on the mission field, and with uh, his sons, and I've had discussions with uh, Melanie Ellis, a, a pastor's daughter who works with us and teaches in that school, and, and you know, um, we've watched other missionaries and and chat longer than i have for sure but even in the year in new guinea you see a kind of a changeover of missionaries and you see attitudes come through and you know we all can agree on that mission station that you're going to need to love god in order to be in papua new guinea okay love of cow cow isn't going to do it the cow cow gets dry man it's not great it's, I mean, it's great staple food, and I'm glad that they've got it there. Uh, I know that with them being locked down, one of the worries that they don't have is food right now because they plant months in advance, and that stuff will keep you going. Cow cow is like energy in a root. It's nice. Not nice to eat, but nice to keep you going. And, uh, you know, love of God is going to be what puts you in Papua New Guinea. You know, we can't be there 
in Papua New Guinea without loving God correctly. And if, uh, if you've heard me preach before, many of you have, and I, I do this over in New Guinea too, one of the things I try and pray before preaching, uh, at the risk of sounding like Brother Hamblin and having the same prayer every time, man, I try and pray that we love God enough to change. Why is that? Because it helps us be obedient. Let's go to John chapter 14. Love of God, loving God the right way is going to help you obey God. You see these people struggling. Some people, man, they, they get saved and they hit the ground running. And some people get saved and they flounder after about two months and struggle. Listen, that person, if that's you tonight, you have a problem loving God the way you are to. You might misunderstand love. Maybe go read 1 Corinthians 13 and see that love is choices. Love is action. Go see what Christ did for you. We're going to look at a couple of those passages here tonight. Christ proved his love to us by humbling himself and coming. Man, people prove their love to you. Your parents prove their love to you by sacrificing. My kids prove their love to me by obeying. <laughs> they sacrifice their freedom. It's nice. I love it. Mark cha- or sorry, John chapter 14. Let's look at verse 15. John chapter 14, verse 15. It says this, If ye love me, keep my commandments. If you skip to verse 21, Christ says again in verse 21, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. You know, there's a lot tied into loving Christ, loving God the way we ought to. And that's an interesting study. If you study what loving God will do for you and unlock for you in in John chapter 14 and John chapter 15, man, that will help your relationship with the Holy Spirit. That will help your relationship with God. There's some promises tied to that in here that we're not going to go into tonight. But notice twice here, over the span of a few verses, Christ says, hey, if you love me, you're going to obey me. We can look at uh, 1 John as well. I believe it's 1 John 3. It, It might be a different chapter. Uh, I didn't write it down because I didn't want to take the time to go there. But man, 1 John talks about if you love God, you're going to obey him. And then John goes on to say, hey, if you're not obeying him and you say you're loving God, we all can point our finger at you and say, you're a liar. Because if you loved God, it wouldn't be a problem to obey him. Now, uh, you know, like I said, uh, (laughs) I have said this at other churches. I believe the last time I preached, I might have said this. I found out you don't have to be perfect to go to Papua New Guinea. Uh, If pastor's honest tonight, he'll stand up here and say, you don't got to be perfect to pastor a church. If pastor Seth's honest, he's going to say, you don't have to be perfect to pick up bread. (laughs) But you know what you got to do? You got to love God. Because that, that attitude, is going to enable you to obey him. Man, we see all throughout the scripture that God is our strength. When you pair that with loving him and you rest in God, so many, so much we, we as Americans are trained to go, man, get that thing done. And uh, come to New Guinea, that'll beat you out, it'll beat, it, it'll beat that out of you a little bit. But man, your strength's in God. I'm getting up to you tonight. Yes, I put some time into studying this. Yes, I put some time into praying over this. Yes, I put some time into thinking about this. And I, uh, I genuinely want to help people. And uh, I genuinely want, at the end of this, for uh, if you need it, you to have an opportunity to change for the better for God. But I also understand that, man, I am just speaking vanity up here. I am doing the foolishness of preaching. And God's got to work on your heart. Man, love God. It'll help you obey. Like I said, I can only go to PNG because I love God. You know what? Love of preaching or love of having fame of being a missionary or getting paid to serve Jesus or loving the adventure of Papua New Guinea or loving the coffee of Papua New Guinea, again, all those things are not going to keep me there. They might help me go on a mission trip there. Man, sticking it out, even a year. I know we're back. But, man, a year is tough. Some of you guys don't make it here. Love God. You here in this church, what are you doing? Man, what are you you loving? 
if a, a, a kind of a counter or a parallel study to this is what Christ says the Pharisees loved. You want to see a powerless people in the New Testament. You want to see people who God was far from. I mean, God even was close to the harlots and the lepers and the tax collectors and the thieves and the crooks of that day. He was far from the Pharisees. They didn't do anything for him. You know what they loved? And they loved that high seat in the temple, the synagogue. They loved the, the clothes that came with the business. They loved the hype that came with that business. They didn't love God. Be careful. You in this church, in my church, in our church, do you love God the way you ought to? Or do you find it hard to obey when he asks you to move, when he asks you to do something? Man, how do you think <laughs> you've got a staff here that's been here uh, you know, cumulatively over 100 years, right? You guys all added up? Are you close to 100 years yet? Between you? We'll add back in there. Definitely over 100 years, right? Service like that doesn't happen because they're getting a great paycheck. It happens because they're loving God. Where's your love for God tonight? Let's go to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. Many people leave. People left Papua New Guinea. Again, some had almost mirror identical opportunities that I had. Why'd they leave? I don't know. I don't know. Good people. I know good people from our church who have left. I don't know. Is it love for God? I don't know. That's kind of one of those things where it's really hard for me to stand up here and point and go, yeah, that's that. That's, they didn't love God enough. Really hard to do that, but... God's got some promises tied to that if you love him the right way. If you're showing that love, talk is cheap, man. Talk is cheap. Matthew chapter 26, let's look at verse 36. Matthew chapter 26, verse 36. We'll read down through verse 39. I was just telling Brother Frank, you've got to blow this thing up if you need it. Maybe I need it if I'm not finding it. Maybe I'm the old guy. Verse 36, Matthew chapter 26, verse 36. It says, then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye down here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to sorrowfully, or to sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Listen to this, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And then he goes on to say, Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. You know, there's a perfect picture of submission right there. Christ knew what was about to happen to him. And he didn't want that to happen to him but he submitted. We're told, again, later on in the New Testament, that we know Christ loves us. We know God loves us because of this action he's about to go through with. That love constrained him to that, forced him to that, because he had love as the right priority. And Christ never, never backed down from anything that the Father told him to do. Never shrugged away from it, never shirked responsibility. Yes, we see a picture into his humanity here. Yes, I'm so thankful that God put that in there uh, because there's stuff, lesser things that I struggle with doing. But at the end of it, he loved his father enough to go through with it. He submitted. Where are we tonight? Where are we tonight? Some of us excuse our sin so quickly or excuse our laziness so fast. But a proper love for God will solve that. It won't matter our inconvenience, and it, it won't matter our hardship. Uh, <laughs> some of you know this better than I, but man, hardship comes. Inconvenience is a daily occurrence. And we're trained, we're privileged enough to be able to choose our inconvenience as Americans. Man, what a blessing to be able to choose our inconvenience. And yet we should love God enough to obey him and to bear that inconvenience, bear that hardship. You can serve, your God your whole, you serve God your whole life by loving him properly. But let me say this as we move into our second point. You're never going to flourish 
with just a love for God. You're never going to flourish with just a love for God. Let's go back to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, and I'll show you what I mean. Man, we can go to Papua New Guinea. We'll stay there because we love our God, but man, we're going to have a hard go at it if we don't get that second side down. If we don't love our neighbor as ourselves, I've seen so many Christians kind of go, well, I have a hard enough time loving God, so I'm not even going to worry about loving my neighbor yet. I'm just going to try and love God. Man, that's wrong. God does not ask you to be perfect in one thing before you start working on the other things. Man, this is this whole sanctification, this whole uh, learning how to be righteous, it's a well-rounded process. Okay? You can't come to church and tithe faithfully because God's working with me on that and still, I want to say the pigeon words, you'd be a fornicator. You can't do that. Your pastor's going to have a conversation with you. It doesn't matter how well you tithe and how much you got that down. We got to work on that all at the same time. And yet again, like I said, so many people work on their love for God and just kind of trash can that, that commandment, the second one. And we're going to see here as we go through these, man, it's more important than we think. Luke chapter 10, let's start in verse 30. Luke chapter 10, verse 30, it says, And Jesus answering said, this is right after he gets asked about what's the greatest commandment. And this scribe basically wants to get weasel his way out of, well, who's my neighbor? And this is the story that Jesus gives afterwards. And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he had saw him, he passed by on the other side. Let me ask you this. Uh, Again, this is an inference. We don't have this written to us one way or the other, but, I mean, wouldn't you assume that a priest loves God? Let's keep going. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. Wouldn't you? I know we got examples of bad Levites in the Bible, but wouldn't you assume that your general everyday Levite serving in the, the ways that the Levites served, being set aside as like the tribe to minister to God for the nation of Israel? I mean, do you understand that back in, I believe it's in Numbers, see that the end of Exodus, the beginning of Numbers, that God said, I set aside the Levites so that they can minister to me for you so that you don't get pestilence. So that you don't have COVID-19 come on you, Israel. That was part of the Levite's work. Facilitate the worship of a nation to keep God happy with them. Wouldn't you think a Levite loves God? Probably the way he ought to. Hmm. Let's keep going. Verse 33, it says, But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Man, that loving of your neighbor makes a difference. That's the point of this story. You've got a scribe who probably would claim they love God the right way. Maybe they're misguided. I don't know. I, I don't think necessarily all of the uh, Protestant leaders, the Protestant pastors, or people, you know, deacons in some of these churches, I don't think they're inherently evil or trying to deceive people by, by using other Bibles or by preaching different doctrines than we are. I don't think that. Maybe some of them, sure, but I don't think that's most of them. And here we've got this scribe who probably is in the same boat, probably hasn't had the Holy Spirit working on him. He's, see, he's seeing everything through those, the, that tunnel vision that the, the law-following Jews had probably loved God, and yet weasel, tried to weasel his way out. Well, who's my neighbor? And Christ gives us this story about the Samaritan who had compassion on this man. If you finish out that story, man, he uh, sacrificed some of what he had with him, some oil and wine. He sacrificed some money out of his own pocket, and then in good faith was basically like, yeah, whatever he charges to the account. Man, I don't care if he wrecks the room, just charge it up there. Here's my credit card. There you go. We're taking care of him. Why? Because he had compassion on him. Somebody he didn't even know. Christian, <laughs> hopefully tonight you love God, but do you love people the way you ought to? Do you love people the way you ought to? We need to have an effect 
on people. Absolutely, without a doubt, I will stand up and defend that statement all day long. We need to have an effect on people. God isn't worried about how many times you go to church. I don't really think God's too broken up about the fact that we're meeting in this fashion. I think he's happy if you're tuning in and happy if you're trying to listen and happy if you're staying in the word. But, you know, God's not bothered by if you go to church or not. Now, I know, I know we show our love to him. I know there's obedience tied into that. I know we've got commands for that. But, man, sometimes we lift up that, I got to be in church. Well, why? Preacher, why? Why? To sing? I can sing at home. Some of you, you're not singing at home. It's okay. It's fun to listen to Pastor Seth. Why? I can give online, Pastor. I could just mail it in. We still have snail mail. I can, cannot God speak to me for my Bible? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we should be here. But man, God's not marking your attendance book. He's checking your attitude. Church is here to help you. We show our love to God by coming and participating, but really it's only half of the equation. Don't forget it. We need to love our neighbor. You know, if you, I, I know a, a, a lot of our men in this church have been saved for a long time and know the answers. They didn't go to Bible college, but they've been in their Bibles pretty faithfully since they got saved. And if you had a question or a counseling issue, probably a bunch of them in here could give you a good answer before you ever got to Pastor Cole. And it'd be a biblical answer and it'd be a right answer. Man, you guys need to love people and avail uh, let, let people come close to you. You know, we've got outreach trying to pull people in, and then sometimes, man, we don't know what to do when they get here. <laughs> it's like you you pull a fish in, and it's just flopping on the deck, and like, well, now what? You hit it with something? I don't know. <laughs> What's going on? Man, we need to affect people. Again, our, man, I, Pastor, I don't want to knock down attendance by saying these things. I, I, hopefully you, you take this in the right spirit, but man, I I I don't know what, long-lasting spiritual fruit you're going to be able to show God from perfect attendance at church if that's all you're taking to him. If that's all you got to show for in heaven, man, you might be a little bit disappointed on that day. That's a good thing. It's a good thing to be in church. Absolutely. I will preach that. I preach it in Kumiana. Hey, show up to church. You don't got nothing else to do. You're sitting in your house and you're dark because you, <laughs> it's just a bush hut. Come to church. We got lights. It's nice. But man, why are you coming? You should love people. You should be trying to be affect people or trying to affect people. Like I said, I, I want to connect that thought. I, I will go to Papua New Guinea because I love God. But I will flourish because I like people. Because I love them the way that I ought to. You know, it, it, it took a little while. I, I had to learn the language. I had to get a little bit acquainted with what's okay to say, what's not okay to say. They changed the rules around the world. I think it's just because they're south of the equator. I'm not sure. But man, everything's different. And, you know, even, even right up before we left, I'd still try and, you know, crack a joke with some of the teenagers and some of the young people there, and they just look at me like, uh, and I'm like, I'm joking. And they're like, okay, I still don't get it. And, you know, it's different. But when our attendance blossomed and when, when God started opening up doors with, with hard cases, with people who had been around the ministry but hadn't really gotten saved or gotten in and, and some of the teenagers started getting saved, it was around Independence Day. And it's because for Independence Day, instead of, and not ours, theirs, uh, for Independence Day, when they're all off, instead of kind of taking a day of rest, and I mean, we're busy. <laughs> we're, 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 Chad's crazy. He's a taskmaster. He's crazy. You think you're busy here? Man, he's crazy. So it's, you know, well within my rights to say, you know what, we're going to take a family day, we're going to sit down and rest. But you know what we did? I went out and I drove and hung out at one of the little shops down there in Kumiane, and uh, there was some, some tension because part of the village didn't want us to put our special meeting on that Pastor Seth and Brother Chris came and preached at. And there was some people who did want it, but, you know, the two other churches there were kind of pulling some political strings. Big mess. Huge mess. Had to pray about it. Had to work on that. But you know what made a difference? Standing around, asking some of the old guys, 
hey, well, you got any stories? You guys are all about your verbal history. What do you got? And man, their, their village pride came out and they're like, yes, let me tell you. But I'm not going to tell you in pidgin that you can understand. I'm going to go back to our village tongue and I'm going to tell you in that. And this guy over here is going to translate for me. Okay. Took like... 45 minutes to get a 15 minute story out of the way, but that's all right. I'm here. I'm listening. I'm with you. Hey, who wants a Coca-Cola? Let's, let's drink some Coca-Cola. Let's stand around and talk. Let's shoot the breeze. Hey, you want to see some pictures from Buffalo snow November? This is when the snow was like this high and it was so cold out. You guys wouldn't even know. And man, it's crazy. And they're like, oh yeah, that's and they're, they're giving these stories. Well, you know what? That man who told that story, he ended up going to bat for us politically. He's still not saved. I don't think we we'll pray for him. The guy who was translating for him, though, man, two weeks earlier, he had been drunk. I mean, like, we use the expression three sheets to the wind. I'm going to do Pastor Seth Proud and say four sheets to the wind. No, five sheets to the wind. Write it down, Pastor Seth. Five sheets to the wind, drunk, just out of his mind. Monday morning, 8 o'clock, when we're starting school, when we're coming over there to go and preach in the RI class. Just absolutely wanted to get in a fight, wanted to have it out. Why, why are we letting these Baptists into our village? Why are we doing this? We already have two churches, and he's really under conviction for his lifestyle. But why are we doing this? And man, some of my guys, they wanted to get up, and they wanted to go back to their old ways and defend how things were. But man, they know, well, I've been saved for a few months now, and I probably shouldn't fight. If I fight, then Missionary Justin's probably going to have a sermon about why fighting is wrong for Christians, and I won't do that, so I'm just going to stand here and just sit here and hold my peace. Man, that was the right move, and I'm glad they did that. Because after that guy translated for me, after we hung out, after I kind of showed my heart to them that, I, that I'm there for them. Yes, I'm here for God. Yes, I'm here to carry his name to a heathen nation, but man, I'm, I'm there for James. I'm there for Simon. I'm there for Jeffrey. I'm there for these guys. He came to that meeting and got saved. Man, that's awesome. You know, when we flourished in Papua New Guinea, it wasn't the first six months. It was the last six. Once I realized how to slow down a little bit and pay attention to people. What are you doing to show your love for people? Let's go to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Almost done with the introduction. Galatians chapter 5. Just kidding. Don't turn it off, please. Galatians chapter 5. We're going to see Paul kind of sum this up for us. And I want you to catch what he says. We were just in it. We just saw what Christ says. Let's see what Paul says. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. It says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Look at verse 14 with me. It says, For all the law... You hear that? All the law is fulfilled in one word. Even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. We were just where Christ is saying, hey, the, the greatest commandment and the second greatest, all the law hangs on these two. And we get over here to Paul. Some years after Christ utters that, Paul says, you know what? <laughs> the law can get summed up in love thy neighbor as thyself. You want to know why? When you start loving God the way you ought to, you're going to start loving what he loves. When you start loving God the way you ought to and you start seeing what he cares about, and then you go back and read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you see who Jesus Christ was fellowshipping with, and you see who Jesus Christ was spending all his time with, and you see the faces, the people who broke Christ's heart, who he had compassion on. He did not have compassion on the Pharisees. He did not have compassion on the scribes and, and the, the lawyers and all these guys who were trying to trip him up. Man, he kind of gave them the cold shoulder for a part of the time. He answered them pretty roughly the other part of the time. I know we all read that like, and Jesus saith unto him. Uh, he was answering them kind of rough getting in their face about how wrong they were because they had turned a worship system that was supposed to have God at the top, they had turned it upside down and put themselves at the top. And Christ went out of his way, inconvenienced himself, starved himself, went without sleep, put himself in danger to be around people. Paul is saying, hey, if you pay attention to who your God is and what he did for you and the fact that he gave his life for you, 
you're going to understand that loving other people is a great way to show your love for God. And that's why I say, man, Christian, please, you can't get hung up and say, well, I, I'm just having a hard time. I just got to love God. Okay, well, add in this other part. Because God's heart is towards people. That's why you're here today. That's why you're here listening to a live stream. Because God loved you enough to put people in your life to put this on to get to you. And he loves you enough tonight to talk to you, to speak directly to you. To go right to your heart. I can only hit your ears. God hits your heart. I'm not up here crafting a, uh, a compelling argument to say that you should love God. I'm, I'm giving you a Bible. Because I want God to do that work. Let's go to 1 John chapter 3. Paul sums up the whole law in love your neighbor as yourself. 1 John chapter 3, we're going to see a little bit of an addition to this, a little bit of specificity added to this commandment. 1 John chapter 3, let's go to verse 14. It says this, We know that we have passed from death into life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Man, these are some severe words from probably <laughs> the most loving guy in the Bible besides Christ. And he's drawing a line here, saying your church family should matter to you. For some of us, Man, your church family should be closer to you than your biological family. And I'm blessed. I've got my family and Kaylee's family both here. Man, you should hear the gasps and the, the amening and what happens in our testimony when we're talking about that to other churches. Man, it's a blessing. That's a treasure. But some of you don't have that. And your Christian brothers and sisters ought to be close to you. I, now, don't get me wrong. I know how weird we are. I know how weird I am. I know how <laughs> I can be like sandpaper sometimes. I got that. I really do. And I've tried really hard not to be that way. We'll talk after. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but man, your brothers and sisters in the Lord, that's who you ought to be loving. That's who you ought to be close to. I know we're supposed to love the lost. I know we're supposed to have uh, compassion on them like Christ did and follow that example. I, I understand Paul, his example through the epistles is, man, he would give up his own salvation to win his countrymen to God. I am not there. I'll give up a lot of stuff, but I'm going to heaven. And I ain't trained that, I, I'm not trained that for you. Thank God I don't have to. But you read that attitude. And then you look through Corinthians, and you look through Ephesians, and you look through Philippians, and you look through even Romans, and you see how much Paul exhorts us to love their brother. And let's go check out one of those passages now. Go to Romans chapter 12. Book of Romans chapter 12. Book of Romans chapter 12. Let's go to verse number 9 says, let love be without dissimulation. Hey, don't fake it. Don't take advantage of people with your love. It's there to help them. It should be action, showing, proving that love. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. In honor, preferring one another. And do you prefer the brethren? I mean, again, I said earlier, talk is cheap. Show me that you prefer the brethren. Show them. I should be showing you that I prefer the brethren. I understand there's a lost world dying and going to hell. My life is dedicated to winning my portion of those people in Bangya Yalibu. Maybe in somewhere else in Papua New Guinea. I don't know where God's going to lead us, but right now, Pengea Yalibu, that's where we're at. And there's 30,000 people there, most of them lost. Most of them, man, it's the jungle life, just the island life. They don't got nothing to do. I know we got to reach them, but man, Christ, John, 
Paul, I'm pretty sure Peter too, all exhort you to unity and to walk with the brethren. Paul says here, in honor, preferring one another. Let's look at 1 John chapter 3 again. 1 John chapter 3, we're just there. Let's go back there. 1 John chapter 3, we're going to go to verse 16. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16 says, Hereby perceive we the love of God. This is how we know it. This is how we can see it. Because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Hey, I, I told you I'm not willing to give up my spot in heaven for anybody. But would you die for anybody in your church? Would you give your life for them? Would you be willing to prematurely end your life to extend your Christian brother's life? Man, what a thought. What a staggering thought. Verse 17 says, But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Man, do you meet other people's needs? I, I know you're thinking, oh, Justin's a missionary. Sean's back there thinking, he blew his head gasket and he called me. What a jerk. I know I take a lot. I know I live off of other people's generosity and your sacrifice. I don't take that lightly. We try and do a good job with what we're given. We try and work our butts off while we're in Papua New Guinea to make your investment count. Uh, but come to Papua New Guinea, you'll see we're a giving person. Or a giving family. And you can't, you can't minister to people without financially contributing. You can't minister to people without giving of your means and of your time. You can't minister to people without inconveniencing yourself. We see this example here. Christ, and, and uh, let's, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. You, you might as well go there since I'm going to reference it. Instead of me getting ahead of myself in my notes, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, look at verse 8. Normally I preach this as a missions giving kind of exhortation for sacrificial giving. This is my sacrificial giving passage. But we get to verse 89 and we see why sacrifice? Why do we hit that? Why can't I just give a little bit of my, my abundance? Why does God go out of his way to point out the churches of Macedonia here? We see the reasoning in verse 8. Paul says, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. It's voluntary. You know, God's not, uh, he's not coming in in the middle of the night and robbing you. He might chasing you. I understand that happens. But he's not forcing you to give. He's not forcing you to come to church. It's something you've got to choose. Verse 9, Paul gives the why. He says, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that he through his poverty might be rich. You know, if you're going to love people the right way, it's going to require some sacrifice. It's going to require you going without just a little bit. It's going to require you to give up some things. I don't have time to go through some of the things that we've given up and then try and encourage you with what God has given us through that. Uh, again, it's not a mission sermon, but can I say you can't outgive God? When we sacrifice for other people, man, there's good things waiting for you on the other side. It, it, it might not be the sum of money that you gave out. It might come in a different way. I understand that. Most of you understand that listening here tonight because we've got a pastor that schools us good on this giving thing. But man, it's worth it. Even on this side, even having some debts out there that haven't been repaid back yet, some sacrifices that haven't been answered by God yet, I can say it's better because this loving other people thing, this is what gives you the long-term fruit, the effectiveness. So tonight, you might be sitting in your, your easy chair that swivels and you can just kind of pump a little bit of hand sanitizer and wipe it and swivel back and watch this thing. Very comfortable. But tonight, have you 
thought or said, man, our church isn't as good as it was five years ago? Have you thought or said, man, we could be doing better? Have you thought or said, eh, it's just not the way it was? I mean, Pastor Cole uh, has gotten up and been honest with stats and figures over the past couple of years. Man, it's not the golden age. Are you loving people the way you ought to? Maybe that's what changed. Man, it's kind of hard to put everything on your pastor and, and say, well, you know, it's his fault that you know, we're not doing that great. How is that biblical? Man, you should read Timothy and Ephesians and Galatians. Go, go, go read those ecclesiastical pistols right there. <laughs> Man, they'll, they'll straighten you out. Because God puts so much on our shoulders as people of the church, as members of the church. And for us to flourish, we should be loving people the way we ought to. For us to do something that matters for God, we're going to need to love people the way that he did, that sacrificial love. For us, as Faith Bible Baptist Church, to five years from now say, hey, we got it. we're doing good. It's going to require you and me to love people the way we ought to. It's not really going to require a revamped Sunday school program, although that could help. It's not going to require a whole bunch of, I mean, we could do VBSs back to back to back to back as much as we had stamina. That's good. It might help but I pr it probably won't be effective unless we're loving people the way we ought to. Tonight, I would ask you, as we close, we'll close in prayer, and as is our custom, we'll flip the switch off, stop broadcasting, but you're about to go to sleep, you're about to get ready for an unwind for the evening. Think about it. Our love is not just stated. If you're a Christian, your love should be showing. People should be able to, without you ever saying a word about it, understand that you love them. People should be able to look at your results and understand, hey, they're following 1 Corinthians 13. Hey, they're following 1 John 1, 2, and 3. Hey, they love Christ the way they ought to. I can tell because they love me the way they ought to. Again, I, I know. I'm hard to love too, ask my mom and dad. Hard to love. Not perfect. Pastor Cole sent me 8,000 miles away. Hard to love. And yet the people who have mattered most have shown a godly love towards me and have made a difference and have helped make me who I am today. Yes, I know I give God credit, but God works through people to affect people. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I pray that you would just take this. Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand the gravity of these commandments and how, Lord, everything hangs on this. Lord, we wouldn't struggle with selfish sins and, and being into alcohol and smoking and pornography and all those outward things. Lord, we wouldn't have pride and we wouldn't have bitterness if we loved people and loved you the way we ought to. Lord, we'd be more zealous for you if we understood how much we lack. Lord, I pray that you do that. Lord, I'm not the best person here. I'm not the most loving person here. I understand that. But Lord, I pray that you'd help each of us to be willing to do better for you, to love you the way we ought to. Lord, we thank you. Proudly sings your name. Amen. See you Sunday.